Todd Macaluso was first thrust into the national spotlight in 2009 when he served on the legal defense team for Casey Anthony during her now infamous run-in with the law. For those who need a little refresher, Anthony was a Florida woman who got arrested and criminally charged after her daughter was kidnapped and later found deceased. Following a contentious six-week trial, the jury ultimately found her not guilty, a decision that was met with public outcry comparable to the O.J. Simpson case. We all know they did it, but money and good lawyers can go a long way. Macaluso wasn't Anthony's lead attorney, but his close involvement with the case did raise his public profile quite a bit. The man primarily responsible for Casey Anthony's defense in court was Jose Baez, whose resume also includes defending such high-profile clients as Aaron Hernandez, Mark Nordlich, and Harvey Weinstein. What made Macaluso's involvement with Casey Anthony such a boom for his career? <laughs> well, to answer that question, it's important to understand just how significant the case was on a legal and cultural level. There's a reason it's so often compared to the OJ verdict. By the time the actual trial had gotten underway, Casey Anthony was already a villain in the eyes of the general public. The court of public opinion had made its final verdict on her long before an actual judge presided over her case. You can call it a media assassination, as Casey herself did. But whatever the reason was, people really didn't like her to begin with. They wanted her locked up, preferably for the rest of her life. The general consensus was, this woman hurt her own daughter and is trying to cover it up. The way the media was portraying it, you'd think it was going to be a cut-and-dry case with an inevitable guilty verdict for the defendant. Casey's daughter, Kaylee, hadn't been seen by her grandparents in a month, and Casey's car smelled like there'd been a body in it. As if that wasn't suspicious enough, Casey later said she hadn't seen her daughter in a month either. She tried to blame a woman named Zanita Fernandez Gonzalez, whom she claimed to be Kaylee's nanny. But it ultimately emerged that Fernandez Gonzalez had never met the Anthonys. Even if the nanny did kidnap her daughter, why didn't she contact the authorities immediately, you might ask? That's an excellent question, and one the prosecution sought to drive home to the jury. Macaluso and the rest of the defense team had a tall task on their hands. They had to plant a seed of doubt in the jury's heads when it already felt like the case had been decided by the public. What they ultimately argued was that Kaylee had accidentally fallen into the family's pool, and Casey's father told her she was going to jail for the rest of her life if anybody found out. They claimed that Casey had been traumatized by years of turmoil at the hands of her father, and that her emotional scars clouded her better judgment. It was a slick way to spin what many thought to be an open-and-shut case. It's exactly the type of sleazy approach Macaluso continued to use in his legal practice. In the end, it worked. Casey Anthony got off, and Macaluso became a household name. Not quite akin to Johnny Cochran, but still pretty famous. Despite the notoriety that the Anthony case developed over the years, Macaluso saw it as an opportunity to propel himself and his career to new heights. There were pictures of him at Anthony's side plastered on every newspaper and magazine across the country. You know what they say, all press is good press. Macaluso got into a bit of trouble of his own before the Anthony case went to trial. He ended up withdrawing from her team after allegations surfaced that he'd misappropriated huge sums of investor money. Macaluso became the subject of an investigation by the California Bar Association, and that was the end of his involvement with Casey Anthony. Macaluso did have other claims to fame, most notably when he represented NFL standout Sean Merriman. The former San Diego Chargers linebacker was accused of domestic abuse by his girlfriend, who was none other than reality TV star Tila Tequila. The charges against Merriman were dismissed less than a week later, but that still provided Macaluso with plenty of face time. Just as his career as a high-profile defense attorney gained some steam, the fraud allegations hit and he was ultimately disbarred in California. What exactly happened here? <laughs> well, as it turns out, Macaluso took part in a scheme to defraud his clients and investors out of millions of dollars. As was later revealed by the FBI, the shady defense attorney reached agreements with prospective investors that used his clients' personal injury cases as collateral. The real kicker was that none of his clients consented to this, and Macaluso even went so far as to forge notary stamps and signatures in an elaborate effort to convince investors to hand over millions of dollars. He actually funded his entire personal injury law practice with these fraudulent investments, which were given under the false pretense that investors would be awarded a portion of clients' future recoveries in court. Basically, if Macaluso was your lawyer and you won money in a lawsuit, 
he'd get his cut and his investors would get theirs, leaving you with whatever was left over. Reports say Macaluso defrauded his clients out of $70,000. He also ended up owing upwards of $1.5 million to his investors. Once he caught wind that he was under investigation, he started paying that back little by little. In 2015, he pleaded guilty to wire fraud and was ordered to pay a $100,000 fine plus $150,000 in restitution to those he defrauded. He was also sentenced to five months behind bars. As the cherry on top of Macaluso's bad news Sunday, he was officially out of a job after the California Bar Association revoked his law license. Before he'd made a name for himself backing big-name clients in high-profile cases, Macaluso cut his teeth on a specific subset of legal cases, aviation-related cases. He was supposedly a pretty good pilot himself, and he eventually became well-known for securing high-award verdicts for his various aviation clients. Court records indicate that Macaluso used his aviation expertise in less legal capacity. In October of 2016, a drug trafficking organization in Haiti came to the States looking for a plane. They needed to transport their product from Ecuador to Honduras. Apparently, this is a pretty common practice for traffickers. They'll oftentimes utilize planes that are registered in the U.S. because they assume they'll attract less attention from the authorities. Macaluso got in contact with a couple of these traffickers who were later identified as Carlos Almonte Vasquez and Humberto Osuna Contreras. They obtained an aircraft from Florida that they planned to use for their venture. However, a few days after getting a hold of it, they learned that it couldn't leave the U.S. So the search was on for another plane that could do the job, and they needed one fast. That's where Macaluso came in. In November of 2016, Vasquez and Contreras found a Falcon 10 registered in the U.S. that fit the bill perfectly. Who was going to pilot this vessel? Macaluso himself, of course. Flight records show that Macaluso flew the plane from Orlando to Port-au-Prince on November 13th. The following day, he met with the smugglers to outline a plan for transporting the product and to discuss his compensation. In the end, they settled on $35,000 as an initial deposit, followed by an additional $150,000 at a later time after the deed was done. Not a bad haul for a day's work, but it was actually an extremely small piece of the overall pie. The aircraft Macaluso was piloting was going to be carrying 1,500 kilos of drugs. That's more than 3,000 pounds of product. How much was it all worth? Try 13 million. Let's take a minute to talk about the people Macaluso got himself mixed up with. Carlos Vasquez represented a man named Victor Pena, who brokered the deal between the supplier of the illegal product and the supplier of the airplane. His co-conspirator, Humberto Contreras, represented the traffickers overseeing the whole operation. One of the other key cogs in the scheme was Alex Duffus, who was the individual supposedly supplying the others with the actual product itself. In conversations between Pena, Duffus, and Contreras, Macaluso's name was brought up several times in connection to the smuggling conspiracy. While Macaluso was undoubtedly honored to be considered a vital member of the team, in the end, those conversations were the final nail in the defense attorney's coffin. As it happened, the Colombian drug supplier known as Alex Duffus was actually a government informant using his communications with the traffickers to build a case for their eventual prosecution. This was really bad news for Macaluso because, as we mentioned, his name had come up quite a few times during said communications. He'd also been recorded by Duffus instructing his co-conspirators about the makeup of the aircraft he'd be using to carry out the smuggling. The FBI built a concrete case against him, taking him into custody before his plane ever left the runway in Haiti. He was arrested by Haitian law enforcement, as were the others involved in the illegal plot. They were all expelled from the country and transported back to New York for prosecution. This ended yet another colorful chapter in Macaluso's storied history of getting in trouble with the law. He was ultimately sentenced to 15 years in federal prison as a consequence for his latest criminal venture. Click to watch one of these next videos and let us know in the comments section whether or not you take the chance to pilot a plane for a cartel one time for $10 million, but there's a 40% chance of going to prison.